I think they've put together a wonderfully varied program for you this afternoon. But most of all, I want to thank you, because you had to buy a ticket. And after spending about, uh, well, about half of my adult lifetime in the theater, I'm able to appreciate a sold-out house like this. I would like to add that uh, Sarah, Sarah's not here anymore. I'd like to add one of her pressures to one of her pressures, the pressure on those of us who are uh, extempor extemporaneously challenged, and we're not really set up for what, uh, uh, for what I'm going to do, but we're going to give it a good try. Before I came into the room, I was not sure what the T stood for in TED, but I understand it stands for technology, and that explains to some extent uh, the, the title uh, that you have inserted in your program. In 1962, I met a behemoth. The behemoth's name was IBM 650. Now, at that time, this was no longer cutting-edge uh, technology. I see a few smiles around the room. Uh, we learned machine language on, on the 650. I was, however, told that it was revolutionary, that we had gone from uh, secret cryptography uh, research uh, during the war to a period in which computers were accepted in scientific research and even in business. Popular culture actually had something to say as early as 1957. Anybody seen uh, Tracy and Hepburn in Best Set? I mean, the real protagonist of the film is a computer, which goes a little bit awry. Uh, but seeing it, I saw it again lately, and uh, it's wonderfully uh, prescient in many ways. Now, in 1962, you see we're not set up for this. In 1962, I was told this would go the way of the dinosaurs, which it did very soon. Uh, everybody seen one of these? Actually, this is a very nice one. I got it in 1960. It's a very nice K&E slide rule. And it did go the way that this had previously gone. Now, in 1986, I worked on my first personal computer, and in 1986, these have become ubiquitous and replaced those. Uh, again, I was told that this would be revolutionary, and indeed, uh, we all know uh, what the follow-on was. It was the internet, it was email. It was uh, all sorts of new forms, new modes of communication, cellular networks, etc. You fill in the blanks. This is the world that you're living in, and I guess I am too. Uh, again, this was all supposedly revolutionary. Important as these uh, developments have, have been, I should like to suggest that something much more profound is in the works. Today, we hear that we live in an information, or even more often perhaps, a knowledge society. Not new, but the modern world over the past five centuries or so has been characterized by a very particular structure of knowledge unknown at any other time or place. That is, by two mutually exclusive epistemologies one in which truth or facts is independent of the good or values, and the second in which human values, ethics, and morals are intrinsic to statements about the world. You'll recognize this, of course. Institutionally, we may think of this as the sciences, the humanities, and for about the past 150 years, the social sciences someplace in between. But in the scholarly world today, Complexity studies in the sciences, which teases apart determinism and predictability in the study of natural systems that choose their futures, and cultural studies, which collapses the divide between the humanities and the social sciences, signal a crisis of this structure. 
The vision of truth values governed by the law of the excluded middle that has underpinned enduring ideas about certainty seems now to demand a reformulation in order to conform to an image of possibilities, from certainty to possibilities. The consequence for those of us who are interested in understanding human, rea human reality, I'm supposedly a social scientist, uh, if I can't say something about the future, I'm out of a job, <laughs> is that we must simultaneously take into consideration structures, that is, long-term irregularities, either in the form of things that don't change at all, at all, or in the form of changes that we can predict, that are regular. And change itself, history. This readmits human values, that is, the basis of choices, as fundamental to analysis and would promote imagining possible alternatives for a more substantively rational future as an analytic goal for those of us who study human reality. In our everyday world, one of the most important concrete and technology-dependent developments already underway today, which will have enormous impact in the years to come, is, however, the way the divide between the scholarly and the non-scholarly is now being challenged. Thanks to search engine technology, every single thing on the internet is equidistant from every other single thing. This implies that every organization or classification criteria is equal, criteria is equal to all others. Now, I know that Pat Years ago, he used to know that if he went to the JRS, he could find something maybe that interests him. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> if I went to the H's, I would probably find some, you know what I'm, we're talking about here? This is the uh, uh, Library of Congress uh, classification system in the library. Uh, it's a product of uh, the 20th century world. Uh, if I went to the H's, I would find something that might be interesting to me as a sociologist, but they weren't necessarily, necessarily side by side. Uh, today, no literature can remain proprietary. Academics and non-academics alike can and now do access literature without regard for, dis for the discipline for which it was originally created. You do this every time you use JSTOR. It doesn't matter if it's a a J or an H, the J store. What matters is the subject matter or the methodological approach, but not necessarily the discipline, the scholarly discipline. The disciplines themselves are thus deprived of much of their gatekeeping function and thereby destabilized just as new cultural communities and political constituencies are created around issues previously segregated in non-communicating areas of knowledge. You can give examples. I mean, an obvious one is environmental studies. Previously clear academic paths to, to degree. You folks follow a different path than I did 50 years ago. To tenure, people like me are going to get tenure in different kinds of ways in the future, are being subverted as a professor or blogger, student or activist, pundit or politico or any combination continuously overlap. Furthermore, they have status, credentials, and competencies that are ambiguous, or at least as difficult to ascertain and evaluate as the worth we should assign to the virtual information they make available. So too is the divide between the academic and the non-academic narrows, the putative opposition between ideas and action is looking for a new definition. The message for social science, now social sciences have, one of the stories of social science is trying to emulate the sciences, and you can imagine why that was true. It was really true for two reasons. Scientists supposedly uh, uh, developed truthful statements and for, us in the social sciences that tra translated as generalizability, and there was a very good reason why we were interested that with that. In that, that was the way you got grants. I mean, 
funding opportunities don't come to those who say, well, I'm going to maybe do X, or maybe find out why something maybe happened. For us, for the message for us as social scientists is that such quandaries as holism versus reductionism, nature versus agency, determination versus freedom, order versus disorder, fact versus value, are dependent not just on contradictory epistemological positions, but more surely on a specific ontological vision of the natural world as composed of independent interacting units, or individuals, rather than the sense that is now emerging of a world made up of fundamentally deterministic but un unpredictable systems. Now, Bing is not here <laughs> anymore either, but you might hear an echo of the prosociality that he was talking about. We find that questions that cannot be answered when approached from an individualistic perspective take on a whole new meaning when we approach the units that we're asking the question about as systems. Participating equally in the production and reproduction of, human, of the human condition, such fields as music and literature, biology and astrophysics will cease to be cultivated in worlds apart. More, moreover, the intellectual sanctions and practical justifications for independent disciplines in the social sciences, where epistemological ambiguities were never put to rest, are disintegrating too with much of the best work impossible to categorize as belonging uniquely to a single discipline. Can we really think about politics without including economics? The future must be that of producing non-contradictory knowledges. That is, not bodies of knowledge that are universal for every time and place, and those that are relative to certain times and places. For it is the overarching structure itself that is changing and thereby rendering the segregation of subject areas according to their supposedly contradiction, contradictory epistemological premises, fact-based or value-loaded, increasingly problematic. This is the real revolution, of which the glittering world of 4G phones and many computers are but a part. It is going to change the way we think about the world, what kind of action we think legitimate and efficacious, and therefore what efforts we will actually be willing to make in favor of one or another possible alternative futures. Thank you.